All right, I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. Time is 6 p.m. If you all would rise, and Mr. Scott Kidd will lead us in the invocation, and Mr. Datron Williams in the Pledges of Allegiance. Would y'all join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your grace. Lord, in this uh, time of Thanksgiving, just uh, thank you for our country and just the, uh, the privileges and the blessings that we have. Lord, thank you for those who have served and fought for us on our behalf to have these freedoms. God, we just uh, thank you for everybody in this room and their, their hearts for your children. And we just thank you for the opportunity to serve your children. Dear God, just watch over us uh, daily in the classroom, in the, in the offices, in the hallways, and just help uh, guide and direct us and do our best to serve your children. Father, we, we ask in this time of, uh, of uh, just uh, your arms of protection around everybody and their families in this uh, holiday time of year. Dear God, we ask that you just continue to guide us and direct us, and uh, Lord, uh, we just seek your will uh, for our lives and for our decisions. And uh, just be with us tonight. Bless this meeting. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor to the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas. One state under God, one indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Kidd, and thank you, Mr. Williams. <laughs> Item 2A, Awards and Recognition, Patrons Influencing Education Award for Dr. Martin Anderson. At this time, I'm going to ask Dr. Curtis Null to come to the podium to introduce our recipient. Dr. Stockton, President Sanders, members of the board. I'm pleased to be here this evening to recognize a man who has made significant investments in our school and in turn our students. I not only represent Conroe High School tonight, but all of our high schools as the automotive technology program is a district program that we are fortunate enough to host on our campus. Uh, here with me tonight to show uh, our gratitude is our automotive technology instructor, Mr. Brian Courtney. I'd like to recognize him. Thank you, Mr. Courtney. <laughs> Dr. Martin Anderson is a man that believes in our students and wants to share his passion for automobiles with the next generation. He understands and appreciates the importance of career and technical education in our schools. Dr. Anderson began his work with the Automotive Technology Program four years ago by no donating drinks and snacks for the students. His desire to help soon led him to bring his vehicles in and providing parts for the students so that they could learn. He has now gone one step further as Dr. Anderson has donated two vehicles to the program and plans to donate two more vehicles and parts so that, so that the students can continue their learning. Furthermore, by donating the vehicles, the students will be able to repair them, then auction them off and bring back more money into the program for continued resources. We appreciate the support and generosity that he has shown over the years, and it is my honor to introduce the November 2013 Pi Award winner Dr. Martin Anderson. And on behalf of the CISD Board of Trustees, I have this plaque for you, and it's a plaque in appreciation of your commitment and dedication to the students of CISD. And this is a Patron Influencing Education Award, so that's the PI Award. So we have a PI for you, too. <laughs> Would you like to say a few words? Hey, do I be important? <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Appreciate all you do. All right, item 2B is citizens' participation. Ms. Ferris, is anyone registered to address the board? Yes. All right. The next 30 minutes have been designated for public participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please remember that the board may not discuss or act upon any issues that are not posted on our agenda. The board has adopted complaint policies that are designed to secure at the lowest administrative level, a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. These policies provide that if a resolution cannot be reached administratively, a person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district's complaint policies can be found on the district's website. Those who have registered to address the board will, have, or will be limited to five minutes for their presentation. Delegations of more than five must appoint one representative to present their views to the board. Ms. Ferris, please call the first person who has signed up to address the board. Cody Bartlett. Good evening. Dr. Stockton, Dr. Gibson, Board of Trustees, I thank you for letting me stay in here tonight. For those of you that do not know me, my name is Cody Bartlett. I'm a product of the Conroe Feeder School system and a proud graduate of Conroe High School. Actually, I was born in this very building and am blessed to be the son of an incredible retired CISD elementary educator, Ms. Janet Bartlett. As you are aware, Janet is nominated as a deserving namesake for one of the new elementary schools and I stand here tonight to ask for your vote. Janet is a product of Conroe ISD, having received her entire public school education in CISD schools, including Anderson Elementary, Crockett Intermediate, Travis Junior High, and Conroe High School, where she cheered on the Tigers as a cheerleader. After high school, she traveled up the road to Sam Houston State University, where at that time she earned her Bachelor of Arts in teaching. After graduation, she returned home to Conroe to begin her calling as an elementary school teacher. Interesting, interestingly enough, she would eventually teach first grade in the very classroom in which she was a student. Janet has served this district with distinction for more than 30 years. All of those years spent teaching in a Conroe ISD elementary classroom. In 1990, after teaching at a few other Conroe elementary schools, she was asked to join the faculty of Giesinger Elementary by then principal, Mrs. Bonnie Wilkinson. It was there that her peers and others and the district would recognize her by awarding her Teacher of the Year for Conroe ISD during the 1993-1994 school year. She eventually retired in 2006, but her passion for edu elementary education has never stopped. Janet's service to this district and the heart she has for students, faculty, parents, and education make her a most deserving nominee and a worthy recipient of this honor. But I'll continue to answer the question as to why Janet. Here are a few reasons. As I mentioned earlier, Janet's a product of this district and community growing up on 506 Wager Street. Um, her career has spanned for more than three decades and her life has been devoted to the children of this community and continues to be today. Education and care for the students is her community service, and one of the most important community services we have. Although she would consider education her biggest community service, her heart is always stretched out of the classroom. She serves on the Board of Trustees for First Baptist Academy here in Conroe and served as her interim director for a period of time. She frequently financially supports numerous nonprofits as well as those less fortunate in this community and never misses an opportunity to help a child in need. She has always given her whole self to the school she's been in through teaching, volunteering, and now an on-demand reliable substitute at the top of the list. Lastly, I ask you to think back to the crowd at the last meeting and the outpouring of community support. In that crowd, there were former parents, students, faculty, 
including teachers, principals, librarians, community members, and family. The support has been a true blessing through this process, and I believe an important component to your decision. I'm completely aware that choosing a career-long teacher hasn't been the norm and only happened once. However, I'm passionate about the work a teacher does and believe that I'm, after spending 30 years in an elementary classroom, educating thousands and devoting your whole self to this district, you're more than deserving of this honor. Dr. Stockton, Board of Trustees, tonight you have an opportunity to cast a vote for a teacher. I ask for your vote. On behalf of all of the teachers who have given themselves to this district, now is the time for one of your new elementary schools to be of a career-long CISD elementary educator who was a product of this district and community and who served this district and community with, with distinction. That name is that of my mother, a school teacher, Janet K. Bartlett. Thank you. Thank you. Adrian Twinney. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here tonight to nominate Dr. Alan Moore as a namesake for one of the new schools. He is a gentleman who has given to this com community with commitment over the years, serving on the board with the Salvation Army. He served on our advisory board since 1994. One of his things is he's taking a careful notice of our family wing in the children in it. He has cared about what we do in the community. He is one of the, the pillars who, over the last couple of years since I've been in the community, has helped the Salvation Army grow. Um, for an example, it is our advisory board that has given a commitment to this community that children who are represented among the homeless, our shelter population has gone up, up from just under 11,000 in 2011 to approximately 19,000 by the end of this year, and he takes a careful eye on that. He is a person who has not just kept his commitment to the land here, but has gone overseas to help our troops overseas. And so, with that same commitment, I want to nominate him as a namesake for one of the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren Longmire. Howdy. My name is Lauren Longmire, and I'm also a proud pro product of Conroe ISD. I graduated from Conroe High School. I went uh, up through everything in the Conroe feeder zone. Um, I'm also currently employed here as a secondary math instructional coach for the district. Um, and as much as I would love to show you what I've been working on the past few days, which is how the scores are going way up and that our junior high teachers are working really awesome and there's one right there and she's really great. Um, that's not why I'm here. Um, so tonight you're going to be choosing who to name the new schools after. And I'd like to tell you that um, it should be named after my dad, Alan Moore. Um, I know that many people think that their parents are the best. And, um, but since returning to Montgomery County, people regularly come up to me and tell me how fortunate I am that my parents are so giving and they don't expect anything in return. They don't need recognition. Um, and I hadn't even thought about this, but uh, many people have brought it up that he is a worthy candidate to have a school named after him. Uh, as a child, I remember being on road trips and dad pulling over the car because he would see um, a homeless family on the side of the road and and he'd go buy them a meal and just spend some time with them and um, and just be kind. My parents fell in love and got married in dental school. My mom's one of six girls, the Webster girls, and it's a very vivacious family full of teachers in the county. 
Their mother was a beloved second grade teacher, Mary Webster, in this district. 35 years ago, my dad decided to start his dental practice in this community, and he's never looked back. He loves Conroe, and he serves it very well. Here's how. Uh, he's spent 26 years in the Conroe Rotary Club, where he's a Paul Harris Fellow, an American Heart Association member. He's a life member of the Montgomery County Fair Association, Connor YMCA board member for six years, Board of Child Protective Services since 1994 as Miss, uh, what are you, Major 20? Captain, Captain 20 uh, said he's been on the Salvation Army Board of Managers. Uh, on, in First Presbyterian Church, he serves as a deacon and an elder. And um, he grew up in, underprivileged, and he got a full ride to University of Texas, where he played football and won two national championships. So his love for football turned into refereeing for 37 years. He's an angel flight volunteer pilot, where he gives he provides free transportation for cancer patients. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I get whatever. Um, he's very humble, and one of his biggest prides is serving where you are and as a school board member. For 12 years, he served. And um, all this service keeps him very busy, obviously. But um, for some reason, when he was 50, or almost 50, he decided when this is the time when you should be slowing down in life, he decided he's going to join the US Army Reserves. So um, he's not just a community hero, he's a national hero. And um, he's currently a lieutenant colonel. He served on five continents and has been awarded seven Army medals. He served twice in Operation Iraqi Freedom. He's very passionate about education. Um, when I was in college, I had planned on going, um, becoming a dentist and going to practice with him, and I was so nervous about telling him that I felt called into education. And when I told him, he was like, I could not be prouder. Um, it was the perfect response. And um, he told me about all that lives I could impact in this field. So I know many of you know my dad, but there are probably things that you didn't know about him. I didn't even know what Captain 20 said, um, some of those things about the Salvation Army. Um, he doesn't brag. He doesn't um, seek recognition. If I could summarize his character in one word, it would be integrity. He will do what's right, whether people are looking or not. And um, he just does things to help other people and to make our community better. So um, I think that anyone could agree that he is an ideal role model um, and that um, naming a school after Lieutenant Colonel Alan A. Moore would be a, a good thing. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Don Hitchcock. Dr. Stockton, Mr. President, Board. My name is Don Heathcott. I've been in the community over 32 years, but I'm glad I'm not in your shoes tonight. Uh, <laughs> there's some very worthy candidates for naming of schools. Uh, I know both uh, Ms. Bartlett, Dr. Moore very well. I'm going to put another name in the ring for you. That's Charlie Patterson. Um, I'm going to read a short letter uh, that I sent to Dr. Gibson. Uh, it's, it's, it's an easy letter to write, um, but very short and to the point. I know most of you know Dr. Uh, Charlie Patterson. But when I looked at the names of the other schools in CISD, I realized that in my 32 years of living in Montgomery County, I personally know or knew 10 of the people for whom they were named. Uh, Dr. John Pete, Gerald Irons, Joel Derrickson, Ann Snyder, Don Buckaloo, Gerald Creighton, Roger Gladys, Chuck York, Harold Craig, and J.L. McCullum. All of them made significant contributions to make CISD the great school district it is today. As we move forward with the naming of future schools, I submit Charlie's name for consideration. And of all the people's names that I've mentioned, I probably actually know Charlie the best. 
Uh, I've been I've served on two CISD bond referendum referendum committees, and both of those times, Charlie supplied the information that gave our committee the insight as to what the needs of the school district were. Um, he helped us prioritize those needs, and he gave and he gave that committee great um, information for us to make a decision. His serving, not only on the administrative side, but in the, as uh, in, uh, at the high school level as assistant principals and later as principal, helped him prepare for his administrative role under several superintendents and as assistant superintendent and deputy superintendent. I think he served at least under three uh, superintendents of CISD. It doesn't sound like much, but you add the fact that he was employed by CSD for over 50 years. He's been more than a faithful servant of CISD. In the community, I've had an opportunity to work with him on several committees at the First Baptist Church, as well as the Rotary Club. One thing about Charlie Patterson, he's very unselfish. He's a very humble man. And you add calming demeanor to those qualities. You've got a gentleman that uh, anyone would like to emulate, and it's with great enthusiasm I submit Charlie Patterson's name for consideration in the naming of one of your schools. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart Schroeder. <clears throat> Okay, I'm gonna break the mold and not nominate anybody. <laughs> President Sanders, members of the board, Dr. Stockton. On behalf of the Cochran's Crossing Builders Association, I want to personally thank the students, the staff, and the parents of Gladys Elementary School for supporting our village association with collecting plastic caps and corks for the recycling competition at the recently uh, completed Three Art Bazaar in the Woodlands. Uh, more importantly, the students at Gladys are learning a valuable life lesson in environmental responsibility thanks to the leadership of their school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Joanne Bacon. President Sanders, Dr. Stockton, and members of the board. My name is Joanne Bacon, and I'm honored to come before you this evening to speak on behalf of my friend and former colleague, Dr. Jean Stewart, who has been nominated as a possible namesake of one of the new CISD schools. I know there are many nominees who are deserving and worthy of this ultimate honor, but I am absolutely sure that Jean Stewart meets all of the criteria for your consideration and selection. I came to Conroe ISD in 1975 as a special education teacher at Travis Junior High School. Mr. Harold Cryer was my principal. There were three resource teachers at Travis and we shared one classroom with partitions separating the math, English, and social studies resource classes. Yes, there were really three of us teaching in one room but it worked. Jean Stewart was one of my fellow teachers in that little room in 1975. Though she too was a rookie teacher, I immediately knew that she had a mature understanding of teaching and learning. Special education was in its infancy back then, but we embraced everything we could learn with Jean leading the charge. Her passion for doing right by students was foundational and her quest for excellence was obvious at the onset of her career. Jean and I later became district-wide diagnosticians, traveling the district, testing at all the schools. Together, we returned to college to pursue our principal certification, and in the 80s, we became assistant principals, Jean at E.B. Rice and I at Crockett Intermediate School. Within a short time, we both became principals, and Jean's example of encouragement and her belief system set the stage for success wherever she served. Our paths continued to parallel 
as we both earn doctorate degrees with Jean serving in several central office capacities. I often sought Jean's advice and counsel as I dealt with critical issues and needed the advice of a trusted wise colleague. She was my go-to person and she always helped me formulate a solution that was good for my students. Jean has an extra sense of fairness and common sense and is able to see both sides of a situation. In her various roles at central office, she was able to deal with contentious situations in a way that allowed everyone to be treated with dignity and grace. Her ability to relate to everyone is one of her strongest attributes. This is a rare and valuable trait, and I'm so grateful to have had access to her expertise and friendship during the past 40 years. While lots of us have been dedicated and worked hard for many years in this district, Jean's impact has far-reaching and lifelong implications for students and their families. I will always be grateful that Jean was instrumental in creating the PASS program, which addresses the needs of critically at-risk elementary students. She knew those students required a special plan to help them well before they reached high school, and she had the ability to foresee and create a program to ensure them the best chance of completing high school. Many of the students who were served at my school, Hawk Alternative School, came to us through the PASS program, through Jean's vision. We will never fully know the difference that this one program has made in the lives of these students and this community. Jean served the, districts, the students of this district in an exemplary fashion on a day-to-day -day basis throughout her 40-year career. However, she also served this community through her work with the Montgomery County United Way, serving on their executive board, as well as on their investment committee. She also served on the Montgomery County Community Foundation Distribution Committee and the YMCA Executive Board. Jean's service to the citizens of Montgomery County also includes her work with Habitat for Humanity and her affiliation with the First United Methodist Church. As you can see, her service to this community has been multidimensional and reaches beyond the school community. Theodore Roosevelt once said, far and away the best prize in life is to work hard at work worth doing. Jean's life and career is a wonderful example of someone who has worked diligently for this district and this community. Her life's work certainly has left a large footprint on this district and this city. And I hope that you recognize her contribution by naming one of the new schools in honor of Dr. Jean E. Stewart. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If it's okay with the board, I'd like to move item 5C up to, as our next item on the agenda. Is anyone issue no objections? All right. Then we're going to jump to item 5C, naming of new facilities. <laughs> Dr. Stock. Okay. Uh, at the October 15th board meeting, uh, it was suggested by the board that each board member send me up to two names uh, to put on a list for discussion tonight in consideration of school naming. <clears throat> I'm going to read those names and then turn it back to President Sanders to complete the item. Uh, he will then ask to take a motion to name Flex 14 which is the school next to Bosman on 3083. And when that's complete, then he'll ask for a motion on Flex 16, which is in the Wood Forest subdivision. The following names were sent to me. Janet Bartlett, Lucille Bradley, George Washington Carver, Charlie Patterson, Gene Stewart, and Wood Forest. Did anyone submit a name that I've inadvertently left off? I don't want to miss a name. No, but could you repeat those for me? Yes, I can. Janet Bartlett, <clears throat> Lucille Bradley, George Washington Carver, Charlie Patterson, Gene Stewart, and Wood Forest. Mr. President? Mr. President? I, I would like to make a motion naming the Flex 14 school near Bosman. So inclined to accept that nomination? Yes, sir. Um, thought long and hard about this, and uh, I believe the one statement that uh, <coughs> carries the day for me on this particular school, uh, there's a statement and a reason. And uh, the statement was uh, that this man 
was the moral compass, the moral compass of this district for a period of time. Take that how you mean it, whatever you mean by it, whatever. That, that, that is an unbelievable statement to make about somebody and their character. So it is with great pleasure and because specifically Charlie L. Patterson was uh, raised in the Conroe oil field, I would be more than proud to nominate my friend Charlie L. Patterson for Flex 14. All right. We have a motion. Is there a second? I second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? I'd like to amend the motion. All right. I, I'd like to amend the motion that we named Washington Harbor. Done more for education than uh, and, and you all know what he did for me personally. Uh, so I'll get into that. I like name it. All right, we have a motion to amend that mo the original motion to George Washington Carver. Is there a second? I'll second. There's a second. All right, is there any discussion? All right, we're going to vote. We have two schools here. Do you have any preferences as it relates to which school we name after? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. We're, we're do. doing 14 right now. We'll get to 16 in a moment. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll use the discussion period to address that issue. Oh, okay, sure, sure. Um, specifically, as I mentioned, Charlie was raised in the Conroe oil field. I think it's very appropriate. Uh, if there was a school to be named after Charlie, I mean, we'll take that mm -hmm. off the table for the for the motion's sake. But there is a reason for naming that specific one after him, and uh, and that is why I'm so inclined. Uh, it's not the first time Charlie's name has come up. It's not the first net time that uh, that he's been deserving. But Charlie is fully retired now, and it's more appropriate, at least in some people's mind, that it that it be uh, uh, considered at this point than it was in the past. For, so with that said, with that school, for that school specifically, because it is on <clears throat> Beach Road, better known as 3083, if you will, and uh, it kind of old stomping ground. So that's that's my personal reason for that school. Doctor, that's Doctor Brown. Is it? Do you have a strong preference one school versus the other? No. I have a strong preference. <laughs> I think we. All right. All right. Is there any other discussion? So okay. for clarification, we're just talking about Flex 14 right now. Correct. Awesome. And, and we're both. So we're just talking about just one school at yes. this point. That's correct. But my fear, we don't name. Okay. But I'll be battling again. I guess the Flex 15. Yes. Okay. Well, I guess the same question. The same question would be back at you, Doctor Brown. Would we be battling with you if he doesn't get the first? One? Yes. Yeah. So I mean, but yeah. Well, straight I up. I so we're in the same place. Yeah, we're, we're in the same place. place. Okay. So what is the motion? So the motion is to amend the original motion to name Flex 14 after George Washington Carver. I retract my my second of George Washington Carver for Bosmas, but this one out on Beach Road specifically. Okay. Then is there a second? Hearing none, that motion dies for lack of a second. So we return to the original motion, which is to name Flex 14 after Charlie L. Patterson. Is there any more discussion? Yes. I would like to say why I can't vote. It has nothing to do with Charlie. I go to church with Charlie and all that. But I made a statement. Audience, I made a statement when I came on the board. That I would never vote for a living person. I stuck with that. Name it through a number of friends, and uh, so uh, I will not be voting for this. It has nothing to do with Charlie Patterson. <coughs> Is there any further discussion? <clears throat> all right. All those in favor, and all those opposed. Five to two. Motion carries to name Flex 14 Charlie L. Patterson Elementary.
Mr. Mr. President, Ms. I'd like to make a motion to um, name Flex 16 the Gene E. Stewart element. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All right, is there any discussion? I'd like to move, I'd like to move to amend the motion. Same motion is name it after discussion. <clears throat> Second. We have a motion and a second to amend the original motion to name the school after Dr. George Washington Carver. Is there any discussion regarding the amendment to the motion? All right. Hearing none, we can vote. All those in favor of naming the school George Washington Carver? I hate to this moment, but you need to vote to amend the motion. I thought that's what we were oh, doing. I thought you said name it. You're going to have to vote just to change just it. Just to amend the motion. Yeah, All I'm right. right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your point of order. I appreciate it. Uh, I even studied this this afternoon because I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> and I messed up anyway. Right. Thank Good you, job. Dr. Brown. All right. So this is a motion to amend the original motion to change it to George Washington Carver. So, is there a motion to approve the amended motion? All those in favor? We're voting, we're voting, we have the we're voting on the amendment. So, all those in favor? All right. And all those opposed? The motion is declined four to three. So, we're back to the original motion, which is to name Flex 16 the Gene is it E. Stewart School. Any further discussion? I'd like to make a statement for the record that although I appreciate what Dr. Stewart does for education or did for education, um, as an educator myself, I would just like to say for the record that I support the naming of the school after an educator. So um, be it the committee, committee's decisions named after Dr. Stewart, that is that's fine by me, but I do want to um, validate the efforts of the Jan K. Bartlett um, campaign. I agree. I think there's I been a ton of great nominees this so time and been extremely hard. No, it's just, just a point of discussion. Any other item for discussion? I submitted um, Ms. Bradley, Lucille Bradley. Um, after hearing her story, I was just compelled to at least put her name in a hat. Uh, Ms. Bradley served the district um, for over 30 years as well. Uh, I think she just turned recently turned uh, 100 years old, um, and I, I'll read an article from, if I, if, if I may, uh, right out of the seat, right out of the um, Chronicle. It says, uh, "Miss Lucille Bradley has lived in Conroe for more than 90 years. Of her 99 years, she taught CISD uh, second graders for 30 years, and was born the same year as President Woodrow Wilson was inaugurated. She will be 100 years old on November the 16th." Ms. Bradley served as an educator, a church violinist, a musician, a pastor's wife of the community. She attended the school in 1920 and 1930 at Conroe College, a private school for elementary and college level, uh, where her foster father was a theologian. I grew up, and it goes on and on. It's, 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 the accolades are just, just tremendous for me. I just, I was compelled to submit her name after seeing this. Um, goes on to speak as. Uh, Ms. Bradley teaching at Booker T. Washington, um, uh, and uh, on and on, and her accolades and her dedication to the community, and uh, I just felt compelled that we should at least acknowledge that. Um, but as it relates to the motion, go ahead. Well, I'd like to make one comment after you're through. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's okay. And I think this goes for everybody that's here. I mean, in, in growing up in this community myself, um, we really appreciate, and it's really wonderful to be part of a community that has so much enthusiasm and passion for uh, the individuals that have impacted all of our lives. And uh, this has really been a, a great process, and uh, we very much appreciate it. I was really impassioned by the, the uh, family members as well uh, and, and their talks. And uh, uh, I think there's so many deserving. So this is a very hard decision. I think somebody mentioned we're in a tough position up here, but I want everybody to, to know that I, I think I speak for everybody, although we can't talk about it, 
uh, that this does not go with a lot, without a lot of uh, contemplation, a lot of prayer, a lot of uh, just thoughtfulness. And I just wanted to say I appreciate everybody, you know, being really passionate about this issue. I echo that, Mr. Kidd. I, I think it's uh, it's hard when you have such great folks that serve our community in a variety of ways. And I agree with you, Jessica, too, that I, I think educators, our schools being named after educators is a great way to do that, too. So it's been difficult for me as well. Yeah. All right, any other comments? Yeah, I have one more. Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult, uh, in, in, in spite of me adoring the person that, that I nominated a while ago, and the person that's been nominated for this school as well, uh, in, in, the, in the middle of this motion, I would just like to say that this is very difficult. But I'd also like to say that the passion, the emphasis on educators is not lost with the two that have been, you know, one of them hasn't been voted on yet. But, um, but there is one, one sure fire thing that is true about CISD that's not necessarily true about a lot of school districts. And that's in spite of what occurs tonight, whether it suits you or whether it doesn't. Uh, we are very blessed with our growth. And our growth will allow uh, uh, almost for certain, okay, uh, other opportunities. And uh, in the very near future, I might add. And so um, it is... I, you know, I, I want to be so very thankful for the for the people that are nominated, but m my heart goes out to those that I don't know how to how else to say that without taking anything away. Obviously, obviously, I was very much for Charlie. Okay, but there are other people here, including Lucille Bradley, which well, my attention as well. That that's an awesome story. That's an awesome lady, and uh, and we're all thankful. I, I just I don't know. Whether that even made that made any sense or not, but I, I felt like saying it. So there. Thank you. <laughs> if you don't like it, fire me. <laughs> All right. Any other comments? All right. We're going to vote on the motion for naming school flex or flex school sixteen to Gene E. Stewart Elementary. All those in favor? And all those opposed. The motion carries six to one. Flex 16 will be named the Gene E. Stewart Elementary School. And again, I would like to say to all those that were nominated, we, we uh, do thank you for all of your service. And as Mr. Husband said, too, there's going to be more opportunities. So please uh, resubmit those names again. Thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda will be the consent agenda item three. The board has had time to review that. Move the approval. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? And all those opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> item 4A, curriculum and instruction. Approval of the 2013-2014 District Improvement Plan. Dr. Stockton. Dr. Chris Hines, if you'll come present that item, please. Good evening, President Sanders, members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Stockton. <clears throat> this evening, I'm here to request, as we do annually, your approval of the 2013-14 District Improvement Plan. Um, I will note that this is a working document and a little bit later than usual because of the change of the accountability system that we shared with you uh, last month at the meeting. Um, but as required, the district shall have a district improvement plan that is developed, evaluated, and revised annually by the superintendent with the assistance of the district level committee. And the purpose of this plan is to guide the district and the campus staff in the improvement of student performance for all student groups in order to attain state standards in respect to the Texas Accountability System indicators. The district improvement plan must include provisions for our comprehensive needs assessment, addressing district student performance of the accountability summary and other appropriate measures. It must include measurable district performance objectives for all appropriate academic excellence indicators for all student populations. It also includes strategies for improvement of student performance. It includes strategies for providing 
uh, information to middle school and junior high and high school students about college opportunities and financial aid opportunities and uh, curriculum choices to prepare for college. It also must identify the resources needed, the staff responsible, and the timeline, and of course the use of formative assessments to uh, gauge how we're doing. And again, as I mentioned, it is a, a work in progress, so we have to <coughs> keep changing as we move along. So we ask for your approval this evening. So moved. We have a motion and a second to approve the district's improvement plan. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor? All those opposed, and the motion carries unanimously. <clears throat> All right. Item 4B is approval of the 2013-2014 Campus Improvement Plan. Dr. Stock. Okay. If, uh, Mrs. Drummond and Dr. Gibson will come up to present that item. Good evening, President Sanders, Dr. Stock, and the members of the board. Dr. Gibson and I are here this evening to request your approval of our campus improvement plans, <clears throat> which are mutually supportive of the district improvement plan. The site-based decision-making committee of each campus shall annually assist the principal in developing, reviewing, and revising the campus improvement plan for the purpose of improving student performance for all student populations with respect to the academic excellence indicators and any other appropriate performance measures for special needs populations. The campus improvement plans are living documents. As Dr. Hines said, we do have them to assess the academic achievement for all students in the school using the Texas Education Agency Accountability Summary. To set performance objectives based on the TEA Accountability Summary, including objectives for special populations. To identify how the goals will be met for all students to determine the resources needed to implement the plan, to identify staff needed to implement the plan, to set timelines for reaching goals, and measure progress toward the performance objectives periodically to ensure that the plan is resulting in academic improvement. Additionally, campus plans must identify the programs and or services funded through state compensatory education funds and any other state or federal funds used for special programs and services. The high school plans also include high school allotment funds. Campus plans must also address parent involvement and violence intervention and prevention. At this time, we ask for your approval of the campus improvement plans. So moved. I approve a motion and second. Is there any discussion or comment? I, I would just like to say I know a lot of work went into these by the site-based on up to the educators and the principals and the and y'all's departments as well and so on and so forth and and there there are a lot of words there and we we do look that we get these we do look at these we do appreciate your work and I didn't it just is a volume of papers and I don't want you to think that we just oh well they do that we'll let them we do pay attention and we and just because we don't have any comments is just because I personally don't have anything that's better than what y'all have. So I, I did pay attention. <laughs> I, I, there's no way that I can compare notes with you all on education. So I do trust you, but I didn't want you to think your work was in vain because I see a lot of people out of here that work real hard on these. Okay? And um, anyway, I just wanted to acknowledge that hard work by, by a lot of people. It was very comprehensive. Yes. Thank you. All right. Is there any other comments? Questions? All right. All those in favor? <coughs> And opposed, mm -hmm. carries unanimously. Item 4C is a targeted improvement plan for Milam Elementary. Dr. All right, I'm going to ask Dr. Gibson to come up and present that uh, item. Good evening, President Sanders, board members, and Dr. Stockton. I do have to tell you that I am just a pin distracted because I am very honored in the process of working in Stewart Elementary School, Charlie Patterson Elementary School. Very exciting. Um, this evening, we are here uh, to ask you to improve, to approve the target improvement plan for Milam Elementary. 
I'd like to introduce to you the principal of Milan, Milam Elementary, Mrs. Patricia Gonzalez, is our school principal. I'd like to introduce her assistant principal, Paola Gorman, and also Sean Lindeen. I'd also like to recognize Dr. Pam Zoda, who has been very instrumental in this process, as well as William Kelly, who has continuously helped us to break down this assessment system along with Dr. Hines. <clears throat> well, we are here tonight because Milam Elementary has received an accountability rating of improvement required. And because of that, they are required to participate in the Texas Accountability Intervention System. But before I, I um, uh, talk a little bit about that process, I'd like to say that, you know, we have been we spent a lot of time understanding this system and we've learned a lot over the past two years. And almost every day we learn something new. But what is very consistent in this new platform is that it has three premises that we fundamentally agree with. One is that it impacts student achievement. Two, that it focuses on higher level thinking skills and rigor. And three, is that it is based on continuous improvement. And that is something that we very much believe in in Conroe ISD. So let me tell you a little bit about what happened in that, as you saw in the presentation previously by Dr. Hines, that there are four indexes to this new platform. What is interesting is that in the previous platform, the AEIS tax, Milam Elementary was recognized, rated recognized for nine consecutive years. And in this system, as we've learned, it has many moving parts. And the first index is the student uh, this, uh, is the overall student achievement, where the target is 50%. The baseline that the state has set is 50%, and Milam earned a 63%, so they were safe there. Uh, the third, I'm going to skip to the third, is closing per performance gaps, and the target is 55%. Uh, this is the index that. Uh, demonstrates that there's not any distinctions between our socioeconomic, our race, and our ethnicity group, and they scored a 64%, and they were safe there. Index 4 was not scored this year for the elementary intermediate schools. So the student progress, progress measure is the measure that we're going to focus on tonight. The target was 30%, and they scored a 28% which put them minus two points into improvement required. This particular index focuses on actual student growth independent of overall achievement levels for each race, ethnicity, student groups, students with disabilities, and English language learners. At the elementary intermediate level, this index applies to reading and mathematics. It does not apply to writing. Writing is uh, assessed in fourth grade, so there's not a two-year comparison. In order to show growth, you have to have a, a two-year comparison. In this index, you can receive one point. One point credit is given for students that met growth expectations, and two points are awarded if students exceed the growth expectations. Now let's see what happened at Milam Elementary. In their fourth grade, 138 students tested. Uh, 79 students had a progress measure that was calculated for reading and were used in, index, in the index two calculations. 72 had a progress measure calculated for math and were used in, index, in the index two calculations. You can see there's a, a pretty large disparity between the number of students that were used in, in the calculation and the number of students tested. So if we look down below, you see that there's a list of students that were not counted due to various reasons. The first one is the one that um, for one time only this year, the limited English proficient students did not count. This was a decision that the state made. So in this particular case at Milam Elementary, uh, 45 LEP students were not counted. Now you might ask, well, they were not counted, but how well did they do? And some did well. We had 12 students that met the progress measure or exceeded the progress, the progress measure. In mathematics, there were 54 students, or 54 left students that were not counted, and 28 met or exceeded the progress measure. Now, this was applied across the district, 
this was just a standard that, that the state had, had made a decision on. And I'm not implying that if they had been counted that perhaps that would have, have um, been stronger because I do this because we do have to strengthen the instructional program at this campus. But it does point out that in my mind there's two different things going on here. There's the process of us meeting compliance, which is what we want to do, and actually beyond that, and there's also how well are our students doing. This does not re necessarily represent how well some of those students did as we passed them on to fifth grade. So students may not, students are not counted if they are tested, if, they're, if they are tested in a different language. For example, third grade Spanish, the high bilingual campus, third grade Spanish, and then if they tested in fourth grade English, and I compare those two, Spanish, Spanish, or English, English, then you could compare. Uh, if there is a change in the tested language from 2012 to 2013, I just did that one, or if there's a change in test version from the star modified to star, then you cannot calculate growth. Uh, if you tested at star modified, or if you tested with star alternate, or you did not test at all in 2012. So there were a number of factors that, that played into this. Dr. Gibson, can I ask a question? Sure. Go back to that slide. So it sounds as though that there were a number of students that you couldn't compare last year's results, this year's results for these varieties of reasons. And so therefore, they were not counted at all in the assessment. Right. Okay. And they may have met progress. They may have. I understand well, you still did, you still have progress. identified that there's some instructional yes. improvement yes. that is needed. But so, I mean, if, out of 138 students to have 79 count and 72 count and the rest not count, that seems significant to me based on my understanding. Yes. And I have a follow-up question to that. And I was going to wait because I'm not sure that you're not going to cover it in okay. the rest of these. but. We have an, a theory in CISD, if I understand it, or, or a basis to, as quickly as possible, move people from, I, I think that's the modified, but whether it is or not, from, from the Spanish version yes, to absolutely. the English version of whatever test yes. they're taking. That's yes. always been our, yes. our objective, okay, with our, whether they're limited English proficient or English as a second language or, I, I don't necessarily even understand all the variances. Is that catching us right here? Is that because if those students are being are in the English version and they either didn't do as well, but they are definitely showing progress if you were able to jump entire tests, I mean, you know, one language to the next, that is progress in and of itself by, you know, it, it, that's proof in the pudding. It, but is that theory catching us in this particular no two years to compare? This it will it will always be a it I will always that. be a variable from this from this system forward. However, we do have in our school district we have an early exit uh, program. It, uh, that is what our bilingual program is early exits, meaning by third grade they're trying as hard as we can to exit those students so that they are taking that third grade English assessment in English. Therefore, you'd have English, English. However, you can't depend on a case by case. And it is basic and it is definitely student driven. But yes, it will always be, it will always be a factor uh, as time goes on. Now, that in that particular scenario, the change of test language in this particular um, case, I would say, what was much more weighted was the limited English proficient not counting at all in this particular case. Well, I can see, I mean, it, it, you said 12 out of however many passed that or, or, or showed improvement. Well, you needed two points. The, the ones that didn't don't count against you, right? Well, it makes your, it makes your, your student group much smaller. Well, I, I'm sorry, uh, but they don't, I mean, you don't have points deducted. I mean, what I'm saying is you needed two points. Mm -hmm. Any one of that, that 12 group, or if there were two that switched, uh, uh, this is the fourth grade, so if they switched from third to fourth, they missed your D-date, okay? Or for some reason came into our campus in the third grade and, 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 the, and took the Spanish in the third grade. You didn't have the two years 
to change them, you needed two points to pass, right? <clears throat> okay. <I> just... <laughs> there would be a preponderance to believe that that would make a difference. Yeah, yeah. but it could make a difference. I'm not trying to make excuses. Yeah, yeah. I, I am, I am yeah. telling you um, that, that it yeah, could go either way. Dr. Gibson, I, I first of all want to applaud you guys for acknowledging that there's an issue and jumping right on it, putting it out front for us all to kind of address. Uh, I don't know what the implications would have been if we would have tested those other kids. It could have went one way or the other. But overall, what I'm seeing here is an issue that's been addressed. And, and I applaud you guys for, you know, taking that head on and taking efforts or taking an approach to remedy that issue. So. And, and, and having said that, let, let me um, tell you some of the things that we must participate in as a district. One is that we have to designate a district coordinator of school improvement, and that is Dr. Zoda. We also had to designate a professional service provider, which is basically an outside consultant. We went through an interview process, and that gentleman is Dr. Jay Staley, and he is a former principal for 22 years and has been a principal at a high at-risk uh, campus and we felt that he had a lot of philosophical beliefs that were similar to ours. So there was a list of things that we have in the process of doing which are um, um, collecting the data, analyzing it, uh, uh, driving, um, uh, designing the needs assessment, uh, it, supporting the campus with district resources, monitoring the progress very closely, evaluating our efforts, and adjusting our plan as needed to, to ensure success. Now this, this process is a two-year process, and uh, next year this time I will be back to share the sustaining efforts and to adjust uh, the target plan, but it is a two-year two process. So some of the goals that we're working on, and this is just a sample, our goals are very specific. Uh, in one through fourth grade students will show a 15%. I'm going to double check my phone to see what's yeah. on. Check the uh, iPad or anything. Yeah. Take off while Somebody has their iPhone on. Let's cut it off. Not just silent, <laughs> off. Because if it rings, we live with that. I can't hear. Thank you. Um, all of our first through fourth grade students will show a 15% increase in mastery of the pick three student expectations <coughs> and perception areas, which need the most instructional improvement in reading. We've kind of adopt this, adopted this um, concept of pick three, meaning that we're working on all of the readiness skills, but we'll go in and look at three of the lowest areas that need attention. And we'll continue to spiral those along with everything else. And we do that for both the students and the teachers. We'll also continue to, um, to work on writing throughout the year. And that will be scored with our six traits writing rubric in the Texas Education Agency rubric. And our three pick threes are uh, flexible grouping, Marzano vocabulary strategies, and tiered assignments. And then lastly, some of the support systems that we have in place to, strength, to strengthen reading, writing, and math at Milam. We have before school tutorials, during and after. We are implementing professional learning communities to focus on instruction. Um, we are providing extensive staff development in the reading and writing processes, tier one best practices, figure 19, and certainly addressing our ELL learners. This campus has two pilots, Success Maker and Achieve 3000. Uh, both build their uh, reading skills and their comprehension skills. And then there is the list of other resources that have been provided that are working very closely with all of us, as well as the coordinators in CNI, all of our directors, myself included. <clears throat> and um, um, I would have to say that uh, this campus has enthusiastically embraced this process, and uh, it really has <clears throat> been a pleasure working with them. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Appreciate that, John. Uh, at this time, we are asking you to approve the so moved. Second. target improvement plan. We have a motion and a second to approve the targeted improvement plan for Milam Elementary. Is there any further discussion or comments? If not, all those in favor and all those opposed. Motion carries. I'd like vote. to say something, if I could, uh, President Sanders. Yes, sir, Dr. Um, as you know, we conduct academic conferences at every campus in September and October. And um, 
the conference at Milam was outstanding. And the, you know, Dr. Gibson mentioned that we're learning about this system and nuances of it and everything. And um, I, I tell you what we, we know for a fact, and that's the professionals, the faculty and staff at Milam love their children. It's a great place for kids. Um, instructionally, they're doing really good things. You know, we, we look at this information, there's some things that we're going to tighten up and, and um, address, but I feel very good about what's going there on there. And, and this is required legislatively to do, but regardless of this, they're going to do a great job with those children, and they do a great job every day. And the administration today is representing the entire uh, faculty and staff, and I will assure you that uh, in the conference, I think you probably had 20 people in the conference. Uh, the majority of, of them were uh, teachers, which they do a great job, and, and they are so committed to doing what's right for kids. It's a great place to be, and, and uh, I appreciate their efforts and appreciate them being here tonight. Very good. Thank you. I think we as a board appreciate it as well. All right, item 5A, child nutrition presentation. Dr. Stock. I am very excited to ask uh, the Director of Child Nutrition, Robin Hughes, to come up and present some information on what's happening in child nutrition. Good evening, President Sanders, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you what's happening in child nutrition. I would like to introduce Karen Pugh, our Assistant Director of Child Nutrition, and she'll be joining me in the presentation tonight. With new leadership comes new ideas, and Karen and I both knew that the menu needed some changes, so after a lot of meetings and brainstorming sessions, many improvements have been made. We've added more variety. We have two entree choices available daily, one hot and one cold for breakfast and lunch. We have a two-week lunch cycle, 16 different lunch entrees in a two-week cycle. More fruits and vegetables, entree salads twice a week, sandwich and wrap option every Monday. Pizza is every other week versus weekly. It used to be weekly. Free treat with lunch one time per week, which could be a small cookie, a small brownie, or a frozen fruit cup. Two-week breakfast cycle, yogurt and cereal offered daily as a cold choice. And the menu changes each grading period to keep kids from getting bored with the meals. Very We're also offering more fresh produce, strawberries, grapes, cucumbers, carrots, tomatoes, salads, jicama sticks, apple slices, oranges, and bananas. You'll see that this year we spent over $142,000 in fresh produce, whereas last year we only spent $85,000. That's an increase of $57,864 just in fresh produce. You might be wondering what, yeah, what is it? <laughs> that was my next question. I, I knew it wasn't just me. I knew it wasn't just me. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. It's taking you for a while. I'm up on this. And I'm not even from Louisiana. I didn't know what that was. I knew, I knew, I knew that was from Texas. Right back, I don't, I'm not the only one that thinks that's from Louisiana. I could. You're good. The young birds are proud of their fair day. It's a member of the legume family. has a delicate, mildly sweet flavor. You can eat it raw or cooked, but you have to peel it. It's packed with beneficial antioxidants and fiber and is a healthy dietary choice. Do the kids like eat it? <laughs> well, it, this is going to roll out in January, but other districts okay. have used it and the kids love it. Yeah, it's like a what is it? Can we have a free one if we stop by the school and have one just to try it out? I just want to know how the girl from Cut and Shoot knew about a jicama and dress you folks tonight. Well, I'm saying, we were had yeah, limited exposure, you know? <laughs> I don't know. The implication there is we didn't think anybody from Cut and Shoot knew anything. That's not, that's not what I think. <laughs> I leave that alone. <laughs> please continue. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. please continue. We also have some new entrees that we've put out this year, such as the creamy cheese enchiladas, Asian orange chicken bowl, chicken fajita taco, our Southwest tomato soup, barbecue stuffed salad, grilled chicken alfredo, which I believe you had last month for your board dinner, um, home, home style chili mac, pierogies parmesan, 
An entree salad such as Chef Fiesta and crispy chicken. We're spending more money on the food. Last year, we spent just over six million on food. This year, we plan to spend 1.6 million more on food, which is approximately 38 cents more per meal. Better food encourages students to select all the available items and eat the full meals versus just snacking. Participation has increased from this time last year. 1,011 more lunch meals per day on average, which is 6.5%, and 388 more breakfast meals per day, which is 6.2%. A quick question here. So we're passing this cost for on to the kids? I uh, know, sir. The um, we, the, the revenue that we take in pays is what we use to fund the food. So it's 38 cents more per meal. Well, we've had a surplus in the past in our food budget, so that instead of buying equipment, because our schools are in good shape now, we're going to put it into the food. So net, net, were we looking to break even? Is that our objective? Why? Yes, I never did understand it. Why are we trying to break even on food? Why is it, why is it imperative that we break even on it? Well, isn't one of the Christian. isn't one of the the basic premises here is this is federally funded uh, child nutrition money, and you either use it or lose it to some degree, okay, to some degree, and you can use it on food or equipment, which we have done in the past. But it's not money that we can take and and save in our surplus fund and and, and do other things with. It's specifically Correct. for this cost. Child nutrition has a okay. separate budget. So. So it, yeah, but it falls under our umbrella. Why aren't we offsetting your? I don't want you to be shortchanged on your equipment. As a oh, result no, sir, of, we're in good shape with equipment. We have state of the art equipment. So there's no net adverse effect for the quality of food increase. Not at all. You know, we have been running a surplus, and in fact, we we had a surplus of approximately what you see as being going into the food this coming year. Uh, but we're taking that surplus as we speak and we're, we're bringing all of our equipment, I mean, we're investing in an equipment uh, and and we will have absolutely all up-to-date equipment. So granted, at some point down the road, we may have to throw in some money. Yeah. But this year we're going to be fine. We're just, because we've, we've got, we're, we're, the, the, the funds for the equipment is coming from last year's surplus. I just didn't want it to be an overemphasis on we, breaking we, even or making money in this category at the expense of a quality meal for the kids. Absolutely. Why we um, we, we're committed to quality meals. That's that's where we are. And we've been trying. We're happy to be there, and we're not going to back off from All right, that. good deal. But that was our charge for the shoes this year, right. increase the quality. Of the good stuff. I like that. And if the two meals that you've shared with us, thank you very much for, uh, or any indication, uh, you have accomplished. That, that's as good a food as you can have. Of course, I'm. Thank that you. meal tomorrow is going to be served to our K through six students for their holiday meal. That's Going to exact meal. <laughs> <laughs> minus minus the pie. The pie. Oh yeah, I'll pay. I'll pay. I'll pay. I'll pay. I'll pay. <laughs> Are these menus healthy, you may ask? Menus averaged over a one-week period for calories, fat, and sodium. Some entrees have more calories and fat than others, but they average out over the week to meet the guidelines. Many items specifically formulated for schools, whole grains on every menu. We offer low-fat and non-fat milk, reduced fat cheese, portion sizes are key. So when you had that great chicken Alfredo last time on the board, um, you can look at the calories, the fat, saturated fat and the carbohydrates and look at that versus a regular olive garden alfredo okay so all of those changes brings us to our new lunch menu and you can see the variety the added fruits and vegetables and how appealing it looks to the student and this is our new breakfast menu We've received a lot of positive feedback. We haven't had any parent complaints on food quality. We've received positive feedback from principals, teachers, students, parents, and nurses. Some of the actual emails that received, I just wanted to email and tell you about the changes in the cafeteria are outstanding. 
The menu looks good and my kids are saying how good the food is. They loved the soup last week. They talked about the hamburgers, chicken alfredo, and baked potatoes. It is so nice to actually have some good food on the menu for the kids to eat. Thanks so much for making it happen and all the hard work. I have heard great comments from the cafeteria staff along with the school staff that are pleased with the changes also. And that's an actual email from a parent. I wanted to send a quick message to let you know the difference in the food this year is amazing. I have lunch duty twice a week and see what the kids are eating. I can't tell you how many times kids have told me they never bought lunch before, but are now going to because of the variety of the menu. You have done a terrific job on providing different choices and including kid-friendly items. Hats off. And that's from a principal. Great job. Great job. I can attest to that. I've been, been speaking in the community and I've been interrupted a couple times. Um, and I called on the person and they said, what's going on in the cafeteria? And I, I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> and said, my son wants to eat lunch there every yeah. day. So <laughs> what's going on? So, Dr. Stockton, I'm responsible for packing lunches in the morning. Uh -huh. I can tell you there's been a big change in me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I applaud you guys there. Absolutely. I want, I want to thank you for addressing it before he brought it to you because we have heard issues before. Yeah. I mean, in the past, you know, we are in schools a lot. And I'm not talking about this year. We haven't heard them. But, you know, continues. And uh, before we brought them to you, we <clears throat> fixed it. Yeah. And we're always thankful for a problem not being a problem, an issue not being a problem. Thank you very much for you, to you and your people. Very not good. just you, but you know, I know everybody's working hard at this. Thank not you. just money. It's hard work. Okay, our kitchens are staffed more efficiently for in the increased workload of the new menu. Employees are proud of the food they're serving. Managers are encouraged to communicate more with the principals and be part of the school family. Managers and staff are participated in a student orientation at 57% of the campuses. I sent out an email to principals and asking them, let us come talk about our new program our new menus, and let's educate our parents before that first day of school. And we had 57% of the campuses who responded. Our managers went and spoke to parents about those menus. We also assisted parents with completing free and reduced applications. And we also accepted free payments to make the first day of school a little smoother for the children. Extra tough one here. What happens when a kid goes up for lunch and he doesn't have any money? I'll let you. That. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we do have a standing no-charge policy, but we do offer students um, a breakfast and a lunch before they're to receive an alternate meal. Um, but we have opened that up to principals, and principals are able to give us their feedback and sort of um, make it more for their school. So we have some schools who have unlimited charging, and we have some schools who have exceeded that um, boundary by, you know, maybe $5 or $10. So it's really a case-by-case -case basis. I'm, I'm, but what you are saying is that every student eats every day. Absolutely. That is it has, I, they want a meal. No. I don't if want to get an have, email and a kid short 25 cent and we didn't feed them. That, no, sir, that we do meant. have an alternate meal that consists of a cheese sandwich, a fruit, and a milk. And that is offered regardless, money, no money. And that is paid for by the district. Can I ask a question? And, and uh, I'll s start with this, that, that uh, my son's grown up in the CISD and they've been very good. It's been an educational process. It's always stressful par for parents like us that our son has a severe peanut allergy. Uh, and, and that's probably another longer discussion with y'all, but is there, what what is the present policy or if there is for having Peanut free type meals, or is that on the radar? K through eight, they are peanut free meals. Uh, Nine through twelve does have a peanut butter jelly sandwich, but they are current. Is peanut free in every school throughout CISD? And that's with regard to what we serve. That's peanut peanut free, or also not. Well, this is. Further, we can talk about it later. That's, uh, <laughs> well, there's also on machines that process yeah, cross contamination. Okay. Back to the uh, kids that short on money. I'd like to see us implement some sort of program to where the 
campuses have some sort of an allowance, if you will, um, for that instance that we take care of those kids. Uh, as long as it's, you know, I, like you said, it's a case by case basis. I don't want an individual thing, but I hate to uh, have a kid not eat simply or, or have a cheese sandwich and, and, and milk simply because they're short one day or two days of uh, 50 cents or so. Whatever the price of lunch is. Have a discussion. Thank you. enough to allow me to well that's really driving me crazy anyway uh, just, just for the record uh, but I would like to say you're kind enough to let me use of uh, uh, the uh, Conroe High School or maybe Dr. Noah was I don't know whether you know it or not but uh, last year for the pancake supper for the Golden Girls okay but in doing that we used to have the pancake supper for the Rotary Club there okay and we would use the deep fryer to cook the bacon okay <laughs> And so you know where I'm going with this. Yes. Uh, peanut allergies or health or any other combination. There are no deep fryer in y'all's kitchen anywhere. Any, matter of fact, it's hard to find something that heats up in y'all's kitchen. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not. I'm just kidding there. But uh, it is. It is neat to see the way that y'all have changed uh, for you know with as health as you acknowledge the health concerns of fried foods and other things. And so the healthiness of the kitchen. And your staff, of course, is just phenomenal there and other places as well. And they all deserve the thing. At the end of that last year, we sent out a principal survey. Results were lack of variety, poor food quality, and no communication by the child nutrition department. We made a very strong effort to address all of these concerns. And we'll conduct another survey at the end of the school year and compare the results and hopefully there's a big improvement, but we will make more improvements as needed. We're also trying to offer better presentation. It's hard to have great food products and covered up in packaging where it can't be seen by the students. So here I went to a campus and here's our chicken fajita taco. It has sour cream and salsa, our charo beans, our fresh strawberries and a side salad. To the right is something that we call a munchable and it's a um, cracker, a soy butter, um, cheese stick, fresh um, carrots and fresh cucumbers. And then down to the left is a picture of our salad bar um, set up with strawberries and fresh juice. They could be hungry. These are some of our students enjoying their lunch. We are having an administrative review. This is an audit conducted by the Texas Department of Agriculture once in a three-year cycle. We're scheduled for February 18th. Six schools will be reviewed. The auditors will be here approximately three days. And the critical areas they'll be reviewing are offering correct portions, the amount of food served documented correctly, meals meet the nutrition guidelines, Claiming meals for federal reimbursement accurately, free and reduced applications processed correctly, and the Texas Public School Nutrition Policy is enforced. New for the 14-15 school year, all breakfast sites with 80% or more free and reduced students must provide free breakfast to all students regardless of status. And as of right now, the schools to be included would be Washington Junior High, Travis Intermediate, Anderson Elementary, Runyon Elementary, Houston Elementary, Creighton Elementary, and Armstrong Elementary. Paid breakfast costs will be absorbed by the Child Nutrition Department. A la carte nutrition guidelines will become more stringent next year, and that includes cafeteria a la carte lines and school vending machines. What do we, what's the deal with the vending machines as it stands now? I've looked at some of them. I think like we're in compliance with that, aren't we, are we not? Yes, sir. Currently, we are in compliance, but it'll get more stringent next year. So we'll have to relook at all of the okay. spinning machines. Is it calories, food type, uh, sugar, fat, sodium? That's going to be I the went target. To a, went to the high school game. I couldn't find a diet coke in it. Butterfinger, the diet, yeah. <laughs> or yeah, yeah. or a chocolate. Yeah, we've we've been real aggressive with the vending machines historically under Dr. Hines' leadership. Skittles have got to have an 
and in, in, in intrinsic value uh, somehow. You can't get them in high school. I have a question. Um, did you guys start, and it, maybe not you guys, but you guys, did you do any sort of um, data collection before this was this change was put in place to see how the kids perform over time as the nutrition at school gets better? Because I've gotten a lot of emails from our my teacher friends in Conroe inviting me to come to their campus to have lunch with them because those lunches are so much better and their kids are acting differently after lunch and they're mm -hmm. noticing a change in their classroom performance. I see a lot of head shaking and, and that's the truth. We know that about our kids. So I'm just wondering if you, there's a lot of studies that they've done in a lot of different places about the nutrition effects on the classroom. I just wonder if you had anything like that going on. We don't have any controlled groups or anything like that. We can definitely watch the trend of academics. Mm -hmm. But I'm getting the same feedback you're getting. Very good. Robin, to give a little perspective, how many meals do we serve a day in our district? Lunch meals, approximately 17,000. 17,000 per day, okay. just for lunch. And then any idea on breakfast? Uh, just a round number. I would say. So we're serving well over 20,000 meals per day in our district. Okay. Y'all are doing a great job. Very good yeah, job. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item on our agenda is 5B. It's the 2014-2015 school calendar information, Dr. Stockton. Dr. Hines, will you come and present that item? Sure will, Dr. Stockton. Good evening, <laughs> President Sanders, members of the board, Dr. Stockton. Uh, I will, first of all, piggyback on that. Uh, the SHAC committee, the School Health Advisory Council, which you appointed uh, last month's meeting, also gives a thumbs up to the child nutrition uh, changes we've seen this year and wanted to pass that along from that group to you. Um, each year, as you know, we go through a process of developing a calendar and tomorrow the district level planning committee will meet tomorrow afternoon and one of the items for discussion will be the, to begin planning for the 14-15 school calendar. And just a couple of reminders, every year this is really an interesting process. In the last couple of years, the um, uh, we changed it and had the semester end before the holidays and seemed to be getting pretty good feedback on that. It, it does have a little bit of an imbalance with the number of days. Um, but that process will get, uh, begin uh, starting tomorrow afternoon. A couple of reminders that uh, the biggest one, probably based on the comments that I receive every year when we post calendar options, I get the comments and we share them with the district level committee meeting. And probably one of the number one comments we always get is, we should start school earlier. And uh, the answer to that one is, no, we can't. And uh, so next year, the first day would be uh, the fourth Monday in August. And uh, we have up here the blank calendar, which would be August the 25th to be the first day of school. That's the earliest that we can have uh, school start. Uh, we have 178 days of instruction. We have two days waivered uh, for staff development. We also have two early release days. We've also taken pretty much the same holidays over the last few years. And we have to include two inclement weather days. Um, and so what we do is we do uh, have two inclement inclement weather days for students, but that also changes the teacher's work calendar because if, um, if the students come on a day that the teachers worked, they'll have to make up the work day on another day that they, uh, so uh, it does have a double impact and we get that information out. And really tonight, this is just for your information and I'm here to see if there's any special instructions or things you'd like me to bring back to the district level uh, planning committee when they start their discussions tomorrow. Well, I have it. Make sure we know Friday before. We... Yes. One time we messed up on that. So people didn't go to church on Friday. Didn't like their school child going to school on Friday. We got a lot of. Fun. Yes, sir. Still talking about a week off for Thanksgiving too. Yes. Continue. Unless you have other feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I have a strong feedback to keep it a week off. Okay. I agree. I would just say I think you got your hands tied by a whole lot of limit, by a whole lot of figures, and and that y'all have kind of perfected this. And I don't see any reason to reinvent the wheel. It's, you've got just about all the good you get out of it when August twenty fifth is the first day. You know. Did I hear you correctly that 
slide direction in, keep the grading period that done before Christmas. We did that for the last two years, and uh, generally that becomes a high school issue, to be honest with you, because of the one semester courses where they had the most impact. And we'll, you know, we'll see how that comes out uh, in the discussions. Uh, haven't heard a lot, but that's usually where the where the discussion generates from is, you know, that need. Uh, you know, a few years ago, obviously we were we were looking at a lot more spring testing than we are having now because the state did back off the number of days that we have to do testing. But there's still a considerable amount of spring testing with two weeks of AP testing and another uh, week or so of the STAR testing. So um, there is an imbalance of testing days in the spring. So they don't feel like they're losing that many academic days. But it is harder on the one semester courses for planning purposes. I did ask our, we, have, we meet a couple times, three times a year with principals and PTA presidents, and I did throw that out um, to them, and they, I think it was a 98 to 2 in favor of keeping it like it is. I substituted last week in a high school and threw it out to all the classes. They're juniors, and I think they're juniors and seniors, and um, they very much, to a person, to a student, like the calendar we're on. So. We'll, we'll continue to get feedback and bring back to you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Sir. Thank you. All right. Item 5B is update on attendance zones for Conroe Feeder Elementary School. Dr. Stockton. I'm going to ask Dr. Hines to stay and present the updated information. He's, I know he's it, been uh, working very hard on these. It starts already, I don't out of date. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. So 14 is Patterson Elementary and 16 is Stewart uh, Elementary. And we will, and I apologize, we do. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot keep up with the times. Uh, times you had change. time sitting over there. <laughs> this is actually a, a, a rendering, uh, uh, an artist rendering of uh, what would be uh, Patterson Elementary, which is south of Bosman Intermediate. And uh, this would be the rendering or the aerial view of Stewart Elementary, which is going to be a K-6. I want to clarify that. And that really posed a few challenges, I think, for us planning, because we're opening two elementaries on uh, either end of our Conroe feeder area. And uh, they'll both open in August of 2014. Um, Patterson Elementary, or 14, as we've been calling it, is on 640 Beach Aircraft Road, which is adjacent to Bosman. And it's going to serve grades K to 4. Uh, Stewart Elementary is located at 680 Fish Creek Thoroughfare, and it's going to be open. It's going to open as a K to 6 campus. And then later this year, you will approve the principal's rules. Uh, <coughs> uh, when a new elementary school opens, we traditionally allow children to complete their final grade level at their current school, as long as the parents provide transportation. That's a question we get quite a bit when we're out. Uh, another question we've had quite a bit are, are you changing the junior high zones on this? And the answer is no. None of this discussion involved anything with the secondary school. Um, and as the process goes, we had a committee form. Um, it's a rather large committee because of the number of campus attendance boundary zones could be impacted. So we pretty much included most of the, uh, if, if not all, the elementary principals in the Conroe feeder and the intermediates in the Conroe feeder. And Dr. Gibson and Dr. Stewart also participated in the process. I'll add that Dr. Stewart had no idea that what the school was named for her. And so these are the participants. Um, and uh, hopefully at next month, we bring our final recommendation to you. Several of our members hopefully will be able to attend. Now, the committee developed multiple scenarios and selected options to present at eight community forums and to receive feedback. And we also had these scenarios up on the district website. We reviewed the comments and the feedback at the first round of forums. And we've actually, as a committee, have already developed our final recommendation to bring back to you. Uh, we've taken it back, not finished going back out. Uh, I think December 3rd is my last day of going out and doing presentations. Um, but we, we plan to bring back our final, final recommendation to you in December for your approval. Um, we, when we started, we decided to have a few objectives 
um, what were our objectives? Well, we wanted to create an attendance boundary that's going to put students in the new schools. We also wanted to reduce enrollment at overcrowded campuses in the area impacted by the new campus. We also want to be mindful that changing schools can be disruptive to families and the routines, and we know that. This is one of the most difficult things that we do because people develop strong relationships and ties to their school. Um, we also wanted to plan for and allow for future growth at our existing and new campuses and to communicate the information. This is a map from our uh, recent demographic study that shows the red highlights of the hot spots in the district, and uh, you're familiar with some of those areas, uh, particularly up in the northwest area, that is the uh, Greystone Hills area near Giesinger and Cryer that's had some pretty fast growth, and then the area south of 2854 is the Wood Force subdivision is included in that area. Uh, also included is the track that's in the uh, um, Strake property, which we know in the future will be developed. There's also some areas along the south part of the loop that are... Uh, Anticipate the past growth and on the southeast part of the loop. And you can see the 242 corridor and the uh, Oak Ridge areas are also been growing rather quickly. So just a few things that we looked at. 14 is, uh, or Patterson Elementary is being built in the area that is currently the attendant zone for Anderson Elementary. So Anderson is going to get tremendously impacted by new campus. Uh, and at 925 students, which is over its capacity of 800 students, that's a good thing. We need to bring Anderson down. Uh, Reeves is uh, currently at 841 and has a capacity of 730 students, and we'd like to reduce the size of Reeves. And if you're familiar with Reeves, with the traffic issues with the loop and things, it'd be nice to shrink that down a little bit. Runyon is just a little above its capacity at 617, so our hope is to shrink Runyon down a little bit. Austin, Houston, and uh, Giesinger are at or near capacity. Uh, and as I mentioned, we expect there to be future growth in the Rice Zones and in the uh, Stewart Elementary Zone. Uh, so regardless of however this goes, we're committed to having quality schools at all of our schools. So what does that mean? Well, we wanted to relieve crowding at Anderson, Reeves, Runyon, Austin, Houston, and Giesinger and allow for future growth at Rice, Giesinger, Cryer, Bosman, and Stewart. So we developed three scenarios for each of the schools. Um, and really for 16, or for Stewart Elementary, we had uh, an elementary and intermediate version because that's a K-6 game. So it, it gets a little bit confusing in the final recommendation. We can purge it back for you. Um, we're going to highlight some of the main features. Our, our committee recommendation is scenario A. Both. I'll, I'll, I'll highlight A so you'll, you'll understand a little bit more about it. Um, but certainly all the scenarios are available on the web, and uh, so we've sent, shared with you some of the comments, also shared with you some of the maps. So, um, and one of, someone asked me what one of the presentations why we liked A, and I said because I think it accomplishes our objectives. Um, and uh, you can see under A that we'll, Austin will come down about 100 students. And we only looked at students that go to Austin that go back to Boston. It was small, it was probably over. One of the things we always share is that later on we want to go back and move more students. We could have rather not move too many and then go whoops. Drop about a hundred drops about a Highlighted. 
We also change that at the intermediate level. It makes sense to us if you're going to go to um, Patterson minus positive. Periods up here. Are the areas from Austin? Just a real quick question. How far are we talking? Is that like Millimac? Whippoorwill, how far out 105 are we right there, or, or can you tell me? Like, oh, the big red line between those two dots on 105 there, is that uh, either Whippoorwill or Willis Waukegan, or what is that? Okay, all right. Then, uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to know how far you were taking somebody back to there and how close they were to Austin. That's the only reason I asked that. Uh, to, so this part came from Runyon to go to Patterson and to the bottom of Anderson, you see these two areas from Austin. And generally the feedback from the Austin, I haven't had a lot, but the couple of people I have talked to, um, obviously when they have children that go to intermediate, they think that's more fun. They already go to Bosman. Uh, and obviously there are people that don't go to Bosman yet that don't necessarily Armstrong, um, these areas down here currently go to Armstrong. We would move those because we're going to take a population up here into Anderson. So it's kind of a lost a lot from Anderson, so we're going to move some students in from areas uh, 14 feet. Uh, A1, uh, right up here along the loop from Reed, brought those to Anderson. These three areas, Anderson area, Anderson, brought these two from Armstrong up to you, kind of sprayed out, kind of moved around. Uh, that's really, that's the scenario. The only variations between this and PC are what we do in the Austin population. Can you, can you go back to the uh, uh, the uh, capacity chart? Yes, sir. And then please continue with what you're saying because I have a question. The only difference is between B and C or what now? Well, what's yes. going to be different is what we did with the Austin. So we, we got a little bit more aggressive with bringing more students to Austin, Patterson, Elementary. That's really what the difference is are between everything else is the same. And you said you can always go back and bring the kids. Correct. My question is, along that line, conservative, don't move any more than you have to, but don't have to redo it, or don't have to do it again, okay? And my question don't have anything to do with your alternatives. It has to do with the difference in Runyon and Wilkinson. Wilkinson has such a larger capacity. Right. And it seems like we're leaving Runyon right at the cusp. Asking. And I don't know those two schools kind of, I mean, they're on the same. I'm not sure they're close enough to, if there's a section we could move. I'm not sure. I'm not even saying we want to. I, I'm simply saying, you know, at 589, when your capacity 610, I mean, you know, I, and even if the area is not growing, I mean, that's close enough. I mean, you're full already. It's, it, is, it is pretty full. It's not a big campus. Right. The reality is not a big campus. We'd like to get them to that size. So it, it, the answer is could be that, yes. I'm not, first of all, I don't, I don't have any any dog in this fight, as they say. I have no, pre I'm just, I just happened to have spot, spotted that there's no wiggle room in running. And you might have to turn around and move kids away, you know, again, because you, left and, and yet you have 400 or 350 uh, capacity left at Wilkinson, and they're the closest two schools in, up in, you know, I mean, they are, barely. I will say that Wilkinson does have some growth. Coming. And Runyon hasn't seen much growth. Okay. Hey, 
I asked the question. I'm not. I'm not saying it needed to be fixed. That's a great question. So uh, let me go back to the document. To, so in B, go down to a different section called AC, uh, which took a few more students out of Austin. Um, then C went back to the version we had with A, added the uh, section on the other side of 105. Uh, that was the difference. Sixteen. You can see the biggest changes uh, under A are for D Singer uh, and Pryor, uh, Bosman, and like sixteen from Poppy. And D Singer, this this would drop D Singer from uh, six twenty uh, from seven hundred. Capacity they're currently at 623, it would drop them down to 185, and it would bring Rice down to 576 students. Prior would drop to 559 students. Bosman goes up just a little bit because we moved that one section elementary. Bosman, that D14 section, changed them by nine students. See what it does with Stewart Elementary. That's that's what that represents. The big unknown is that's today we think that area is growing faster than that. So we think new bodies are higher. No, what able to expand them. No, there. So again, A is your rec is your preference. Yes, uh, A is your the committee's preference. preference. Excuse me. And it's not a I say that I don't mean it. It's a hundred percent. I like to. This really is really have to follow boundary changes. That area south. Again, again, for for just for uh, understanding's sake, the the road in the uh, uh, it ends in the you know if you're close to a, like a capital E near the blue dot. See the long road? Is that Leonis Horton, or am I too far out? Yeah, that road that comes down going south that, that has the the J in it, the hook to. I don't know how to explain it to you. Oh, not South. the little one, the big one, South. the long one, to the left of what you just pointed at. That comes further down. That follow your finger all the way down. Comes all the way down in there. What road is that? Or what subdivision is that? Or something? Yeah. Okay. That's what I was asking. All right. The deep version for progressive added four A from the singer goes flex. Certainly had some feedback. Felt like
Yes, a growing area. That's, that's going to give us several years. Okay. It's not growing fast. I think, I think the real reason is why us kids, Fish Creek, you know, we believe in neighborhood schools and reasonableness, okay? And both areas are going to grow. So, that, you know, by move, making it a K through six rather than, I mean, that's the effect of the difference. And I, I, I think that's very wise, you know, it, same principle in the back of the woodland. Why, why bus kids all the way to the other side of the woodlands for, for uh, intermediate and make an intermediate even bigger than it already is in Mitchell's case. And you could have a K through six that would function in that area very well. I commend y'all for being wise enough to think that for Dr. Hines, can you show me again just uh, what the Charlie Patterson kids will end up going Bosman Intermediate? Like 16 sewer kids will go to junior high school. And I want to commend Dr. Hines for, and Dr. Gibson for all. They're, they're they're on the road <laughs> a couple times a week doing forums and getting lots of feedback, so it's, that's great. Thank you, Dr. Hyman. All right, item 5E is an approval of CM at risk contractor selections for Oak Ridge ninth grade edition, Vogel edition, Oak Ridge school road. Dr. Stockton? Uh, Ms. Foster, if you'll present that uh, item, please. Contract. 
So moved. We have a motion and a second to approve Eurotech, DTT, and Dingco that the CM at risk contractor selections Oak Ridge Ninth Grade Campus, Vogel in addition, and the Oak Ridge School Road. Is there any comments or questions? Discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All, All right. right. And next item is approval of the E rate dark fiber services at multiple locations. And Ms. Foster, please. We have a motion. Is there a second? We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Yes. I, I, unlike uh, other times, I, I see no comparison of you know of how y'all compared these. Uh, and, and and let me go on record as saying I have no problem with Wave Media. I know exactly who they are, and I know that they can do the work. I mean, that's not my issue. My issue is a board member. I see that six people responded, and I have no information preparing sick unless I missed it I mean I, all I see is the uh, well the the bid sheet you know and I guess 414 was the low bid or what y'all wanted it done I, I'm not sure exactly how the RFP worked but This would, are you saying this was included? Well, I, I'm looking at the, the, the you know, a thing that says the CISD campuses circuit type termination A, termination Z, and a $414,120 total that compares no different than. Uh, it would have been. Well, that's going there. around. Um, I have no problem with this project and want to spend money on technology. My concern is probably more um, for Mr. Clark, even though we you know, have the money in the 2008. Also, I have a, a concern about placing it in bond money um, because it's not a long term capital project. And I, I just feel like have the cash or it wouldn't be detrimental to use our cash. I would I would fund the project out of cash, not out of our bond money, but that's just my personal perspective. Um, just because I have a, a hard time committing um, bond money to, to this particular short term kind of project. But I think technology will change enough that you'll be changing that within five to seven years. I don't think they'll be there 30 years from now. But it is. But, I mean, it's not a huge um, So in that light, because it's not a huge that's why I would like to. And so 
consider his passion than That's why I said, <laughs> that's nice why I said it's really a Mr. Nice Fox answer. question, but uh, that's just my com comment. I, I, I'm in favor of the It's an project. expansion of our of our really? network, which, infrastructure. which our infrastructure, which we have funded out of bond. Uh, we don't really have pl the. This is where the funds are, <laughs> but fiber underground. Oh, I understand what it is. I, I understand what it is. I also understand the fiber that's dug up sure. periodically, yeah. like every so often, as new fiber or new technology comes out. And the bonds that we're doing are more long term, and it, it's just a philosophical. Absolutely. I'm funding the project. Good point. I mean, I mean we're, I'm we're, funding the project. I want to spend money on technology. We, 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 I'm just trying to consider. I don't think we can change it at this point, okay. but going forward, would. We'll that, awesome? that would be my consideration going I agree forward with you. I mean, when we're looking at fiber same, or technology like buses. buses. And buses. Yeah, can, we had that discussion, so just I just want to go on record of saying Mr. that. Mr. Cox, I have another question, if you don't mind, up there. Because these are leased lines, I mean, is there some cost savings that are generated uh, by us not having to lease these lines any longer since we're going to have oh, our yeah. own lines? Uh, uh, some, definitely. So in that regard, I kind of agree with Ms. Haynes that, you know, going to have some cost savings out of it. Why don't we just pay cash for it? And in a couple of years, it's paid for, and we don't have to pay interest on that $400,000. Right now, uh, they are only like one gig lines over here. We'll get our own fiber in the ground. Oh, absolutely. I understand. I understand the, we don't have that the, the capacity that you're going to be able to have. I just think it seems like we're going to be able to create that cost savings fairly quickly. Magnitude of the saving. Yeah. Or, yeah. You don't know I bet plan. there's a shorter payback than and then the bond. That's yeah. my only but, thing. But the savings, but, I mean, we the may not be able to do it on this project. Way. It's just where you're pulling the money from. Part of, yeah, the, the, part of my like rationale on the buses and the technology, and Mr. Cox, you and I have had that money. discussion, but particularly as we go forward on future bonds, I think people will look at to what kind of projects we capitalize and we put into long-term bond projects. So Question. as we go forward, I just want to make sure that we're looking at what we're putting into the, you know, the various bonds. That's my only comment. I agree. Okay. All right. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, next question I have is, I think, again, I haven't looked at this information the, comparing the different vendors, okay? And I'm just, I, I'm sure y'all are right, and I'm sure y'all have chosen the right one, but... Uh, when is this project due to start? Oh, uh, given our approval, how about that? <laughs> so the work is going to start when? I'm sorry, I didn't. Work Again, again, I have no problem with Wave Media. I absolutely want the, the project to go forward, but I would like to see those. So for that reason, Mr. President, I would ask that we table this a month. If it's not going to you, Dr. Stockton, or the technology department, or, you know, or anybody else. If, if it is, I can get over it, but I don't like when I don't get the info. Okay. I, I, I would respectfully request that we wait a month and, and give us the info, and then we'll vote so, for it, I'm sure. So your motion is to table this item till next month. Why don't we just pull it? Okay, we're going to pull the item for yeah. consideration, yes. Bring it back. Okay. Well, we we'll, we'll, we'll bring it back. We have, we have a motion and a second on the table to pull it right now. Yeah, we already have a motion and a second on the table. Yeah, Lee, I won't pull it. <laughs> I, 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 I don't mind, but I think I would, I would, I would, I would, res I would yeah. respectfully request uh, that we table it. We'll if, table if, it if that's an amendment, okay. so uh, that's an well, amendment. Not table it's the right thing. You just got to vote on the table. Okay. Set. Okay. So is there a second to table it? Do we have to second it? I thought so. Okay. So is there a second to table this item until next month? I'll second it. Okay, there is a motion and a second to table this item until next month's board meeting. 
Any discussion or comments? All right. All those in favor of the amendment to table this item, vote now. <laughs> okay. And all those opposed to tabling this. All right. Motion. Now we, get a vote. now we have to vote on the original motion, which is to expend the four hundred fourteen thousand plus dollars to put in the E-rate dark fiber services at the 19 campuses using bond proceeds. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Any other comment or discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Six to one. Motion carries. All right. Item 5G, bond referendum update. Dr. Stockton, All right. Mr. Foster. All right. um, Foster, you present this item. Thank you. You're never going to tonight. You are taking good minutes, aren't you, Mary? <clears throat> they turn it over to it. This project contractually are. Likewise, so. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Thank you. All right, item 6A, approved parameter sale order for series 2014 school bonds and refunding bonds. Dr. Stockton? Mr. Cox, I'll ask you to come present that item, please. President Sanders, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, uh, I recommend that the Board of Trustees approve the order authorizing the issuance of Conroe Independent School District Unlimited Tax Bonds setting certain parameters for the bonds, authorizing the superintendent and chief financial officer to approve the amount, the interest rate, price, including the terms thereof, and certain other procedures and provisions related thereto. The approximate new issue amount is 46 million from the 2008 bond referendum. The bond sale will provide funds for equipment and furnishings for current schools under construction, building renovations, Oak Ridge School Road improvements, life cycle replacement projects, technology, land purchases, and buses. In addition, the district expects to issue approximately 4.3 million in refunding bonds if appropriate. Savings can be realized by the refund. The current estimated savings in debt service uh, on the issuance of that 4.3 million is approximately $500,000. The Ryan O'Hara, our financial Bosk and Wendy Clunan with Andrews and Garth are here if you have any questions. So move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion or comments? I like it when I hear savings of yeah, $500,000. You say the savings part. And we'll That's that. right. <laughs> Enough to pay for that fiber. <laughs> <laughs> That was kind of my point. That's, that's a good kind point. Like that's that was my point. point. You're going to have to spend it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any other comments or questions? All in favor and all opposed. Motion carries unanimously. All right, financial reports, Dr. Stockton. Mm -hmm. Rice, if you'll come up and present the financial reports. Thank you. 
Thank you for coming. Brian. Yeah, thank you. Let you talk save us five. This service went on. This Our wellness center had uh, 607 honors. Total out one. That's our value at the end of the day. Weighted average. Weighted average. Uh, now that is uh, a couple months ago. It's now established. Uh, capital One, as we discussed, are now account after. There you go. Finalized our state. Go out to our ladder. For our benchmark. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Very good. All right. Item. Seven is executive session. We will consider the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer employee, or to hear complaints or charges against a public officer or employee. The closed session of the board will now be held on the matters contained in the notice for this meeting as authorized by sections 551.072 and 551.074 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Should the board determine that any final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed or executive meeting or session, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be at either A, this public meeting upon the reconvening of this public meeting, or B, at a subsequent public meeting of the board upon notice thereof, as the board shall determine. A closed session of the board will now be held. The time is now 8.14 p.m. All right, the board is now in open session. The time is 9 p.m. Next item on our agenda is the election of directors for the Montgomery County Appraisal District. Doctor? This is Gladys. Thank you, Dr. Stockton. Did you know, uh, you received the ballots and uh, the resolution regarding the uh, Montgomery County Appraisal District Board of Directors election. 
you all have uh, the majority of votes, 1,698 very few votes have been cast at this point. Only a total of 195 votes have been cast by other taxing jurisdictions. It's my understanding that it would take for anyone to be elected to the board between 650 and 675 votes. Any candidate that gets that many votes most likely be on the Democrat board. Um, so, all right. Dr. We Brown, have how many? I, I would move that the CSD Board of Trustees cast 675 votes for Tom Cox, 675 votes for Ed Tamp, and the remainder of our votes go to John Wheeler. Second. Second. All right. Writing all this down. So 670, the, the motion and second been made to cast 675 votes for Tom Cox, 675 votes for Ed Chance, and the remainder to go to John Wiesner. Is there any discussion or comment? All right. All those in favor? And all those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Item 9B, termination or term employment contract. Harold Gregory. Uh, Mr. Sanders, uh, I move that the board immediately terminate the term contract of Harold Gregory Goodrum for good cause. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? And all those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you.